He d been really looking forward to being Superman. But when all was said and done, he was just glad to be back with his mom and happy to be able to see his girlfriend again. All he wanted now was a normal life. The scientists nodded and made their notes, leaving out the part about his gladness, his mother and his girlfriend. Naturally tests were carried out. But no device could show the faintest trace of any growth in Mark S. head. Results showed it had indeed disappeared. It had taken him a long time to figure out the controls of the ship, he said, and that explained why it had taken four days to return to Earth, given the incredible speeds the ship was capable of. He thought it might be useful to us here on Earth. The scientists wanted to know what had happened to the bigger ship. The mother ship, as it was clear now that the craft Mark had used to return to Earth was only a landing craft. The bigger ship had been just too complicated. Mark explained. He had abandoned it in favor of the smaller, easier to fly landing craft. The scientist's eyes lit up. So the bigger ship is still out there. Mark admitted that it was. It is still out there, somewhere in the solar system, waiting to be found. Mark Cool DNT tell them where, exactly he was only a 15-year-old boy, not an astronaut. But he could willingly show them what little he knew about the controls of the landing craft. The scientists wasted no time in lengthy expressions of gratitude. They could not wait to get their hands on this alien technology that had been like a barb in their sides ever since the aliens' arrival in 2013. Mark pointed out, to no avail, that the Soros had not been aliens. And in the next few days he was not surprised to see that his advice was not really considered valuable. Just show us what buttons to press, son. Seemed to be the standard scientist's attitude. Then run along back to your computer games. Leave this to people who really know what they redoing, computer games. Replied Mark, okay, so he did as he was told. The search for the mothership would begin at once, however, the holy grail of the 21st century. The search was also on to find those others who had been implanted by Soros devices. Medical researchers were desperate to find out how those things worked. Jeanette was invited to take part in the track down operation, but she remembered her husband. John, and declined. She had had enough of such matters. A very much doctored version of events was relayed to the world's media. It was Talbot who explained that this story of mysterious enemies from space, destroyed by a 15-year-old boy, well, it would be just too much for the public to take. It could cause huge panic, civil disorder even. On a personal level it would entirely disrupt the lives of Mark. Jeanette and Carrie's family too. He could be viewed by some as a kind of messiah figure. He would not get another moment's peace. Did he really want that? So no the truth was that Mark had been selected as a witness to the Soros days. They had chosen him rather than a political or military figure because of his comparative innocence, and the ability that would give him to report the truth. It was agreed that the Soros had originally come from Earth, but now they were dying and wanted to return to space because that is where they had spent most of their lives. Talbot liked the space funeral idea. But they had left humankind their legacy of technology in the form of the landing craft, and our future was bright with the prospects of the many gifts that technology would bring. A new era was indeed about to begin for the human race. That, Talbot declared, would form the basis of press releases. After a few hectic weeks the publicity started to die down. The house in touch had been rebuilt. Jeanette reopened her surgery and was able and glad, to go back to work. Her practice was now a great attraction in the little community. The waiting room had never been so full of so many healthy people. But she did not mind. Normality, or at least a version of it, was starting to re-enter her life and the memory of the summer's traumas began to fade, for that is the way of even the sharpest of experiences, as she well knew. General Talbot stayed in close contact. He did his best to ensure that the excesses of media curiosity did not disturb Jeanette and her son. There was no shortage of requests for interviews, book offers from publishers vying for their story and TV companies falling over themselves to produce TV specials. The specials and books appeared eventually anyway, as could only be expected in the aftermath of such sensational events. Roberts and a team of 50 net detectives, they sound like butterfly hunters. Mused Carey, were making considerable progress in tracking down the human league. He had no doubt that the murderers would be brought to account for what they had done. Mark said that he had every confidence in Roberts. 
The inspector seemed strangely pleased by that remark. In August, school restarted. Mark entered his fifth year, but started late to allow time for the trauma of the summer to pass somewhat. Many people remarked, however, that if anyone ever looked less traumatized than Mark Daniels they would like to meet him. And, of course, he and Carrie continued to meet. 35 Blue Dolphins. One evening, in mid-October, when the hue and cry was beginning to die down. Mark and Carrie were sitting on the swings at the swing park. They held hands. After a comfortable silence that had lasted a couple of minutes, she looked at him askance for a moment. What, she said, with a wicked smile. Mark looked wide-eyed, what do you mean? What, I don't know what you re-talking about, and I deny it all, look at me. Daniels, and Don T give me that wide-eyed and innocent look. I am not buying it. Buster. You re-up to something, I am not. He ran a hand through his hair. You are, am not, are too, am not either, hum I don't t trust you. She pinched the flesh around his ribs. There was not much to get hold of. Oh well. I was just remembering the last time we had a chance to sit like this and make fun of each other, that s all. He stretched out a hand, as if examining his fingernails, he waggled his fingers a little. In the pocket of Carrie's jacket her mobile phone began to buzz. Oh God. That s gin. I bet, wanting to know where I am. As she took the mobile out of her pocket its sound changed suddenly. Instead of a buzz, it became a tune, a jaunty little melody that Carrie remembered hearing on an ancient cassette tape recording at her grandmother's house. Hey, what is going on, I don't know. Replied Mark, how should I know, I know that tune it is Caledonia, hey. I love that song. Who was the singer that used to sing it, oh. I don't know. Said Mark, somebody McLean, was it, it is quite a nice tune, actually. Well, not on this thing, of course, how does it go? The words. I mean, let me see tum tea. Tum tea that I tum tea yes, let me tell you that I love you and I think about you all the time Carrie suddenly looked embarrassed. Why, really? Carrie Jenkins. I am shocked. Flattered, as well, but very. Deeply shocked. My, my. Jenkins, you re-blushing, what? You. You did that. You made me say that. She belted him on the arm. How did you hey, wait a minute. Daniels you you've done this. You somehow made that tune come over the phone. You haven t lost your power at all, Mark laughed. Do you remember when we visited the Soros Museum in June that we kind of thought things weren't t quite as they seemed? Hmm hmm, and I said that it was like looking at one of those crazy patterns that if you look at it long enough you begin to see what s really hidden there, blue dolphins on motorcycles. Cried Carrie, I see where you re-bumbling to with this you re the pattern of dots and no one s been able to see you as you really are. You ve fooled the scientists and everybody. Can I ask why, I ll tell you why. When I was on that ship. I thought the game was up and I was going to die. Really I thought that was it and I was going to die right there and then. Well, there was one memory brought me back and made me want to fight an, oh, yes. Do you know what that memory was, er, it was you. You standing by a fence, saying I love you behind my back, oh. Well. I didnt actually think you d heard that actually, hmm. And shall I tell you what else, well. I think you d better, I love you, Carrie smiled and pulled him close. When the kiss had ended. Mark looked at her and said. I don't really want anything else than to be here, with you. I don't want to be tested, and scrutinized by minds immeasurably superior to mine, Carrie smiled, recognizing the reference to the War of the Worlds album. I don't want to be taken away from here, from you, just a stay at home fella, ain't he ya, guess so. But that s what would happen. I d never have any peace again if anyone found out what I can do. Scientists would test me and poke me about, and the politicians or the military would try to make me do stuff for them. It would just be horrible. So the best thing I can do is pretend I don't have any power anymore. That way maybe eventually they ll leave me alone. So it s our secret, okay, okay. You re the blue dolphin in the picture, and the picture is the pattern of your life, right school, homework, chores for mum, everything I do, and, no one sees you re there. Except me, and my mother. I cool dnt really hide it from her. And in fact, you wouldn't t want to. I know. Good boy. Daniels. It s cool. They kissed again. You know. 
Carrie, they watch me all the time, the security people, how do you know, the ship. I am in constant contact with the ship and it monitors everything. I mean everything. The power it gives me is unbelievable. From way out in space, it can read a person's body language and tell me what they re going to do, or if they re lying. Or suppose someone was hiding in that shrubbery over there watching us, the ship's sensors can detect his breath exhalations and the difference between his body temperature and what's around him, hmm. You really know how to impress a girl. Is there someone in the shrubbery, no, well, thank goodness for that. Carrie murmured, kissing Mark's lips. Er he s in the some trees up on that hillside, about half a mile off to the right. He s got those electronic night vision things, you know like binoculars, what, Mark laughed softly. Don t worry. He can t harm us. He s just doing his job. Part of several surveillance teams they've a got watching us all the time. Don t worry about it, you one t know they re there, you re kidding me, right, and he s proving I am normal, but you re not normal. What else can you do? Can you fly? Can you see through walls? Well yes, and sort of. The ship's sensors see through walls in and relay the information to me. And that's not the half of it. If I concentrate a bit, and really try to imagine clearly what I want to happen, then it happens. I tried flying one night, but it wasn't very comfortable. You know when you drive down the motorway your windscreen gets covered in dead bugs, Carrie nodded. Flying s a bit like that quite messy. And if you fly fast the buttons get torn off your shirt with the force of the wind resistance, oh my. I d quite like to see, shut up. Then there s power lines and stuff all over and it s pretty cold, and it s just i l l take you up if you like, hmm. Yes, but i l l dress up more warmly first, if you don t mind, you've a seen me go through things, like that fence, but I can shift through space as well, teleport. Wow, yeah. I can take you too. But a lot of it's controlled by the ship. It figures out coordinates and all that then I just have to will it, so right now, you could just think about it and you and me could find ourselves in Antarctica, that's right. Or the moon, or look, why don't we go up to the ship. Then I can show you around, yes. But not right now. I imagine that would take some time, and I have to be home at 10. You need to investigate alien ships at a fairly leisurely pace. I am reliably informed, Mark laughed. You rewrite. But Carrie, what? Mark, Carrie, the thing is. I am not sure what to do with all this power. Obviously I can t go flying about the place, or that would give the game away. Oh, of course I could always wear a costume and change my hairstyle and then no one would ever recognize me, but hold on. Superman I can call you Superman, can t I or can I call you Super for short. Or simply Soup. Our Sue. A boy named Sue. Or maybe we can think up some other catchy superhero name for you. But we have to be clear on one point upon which I must insist you are on no account to around wearing your underpants on the outside of your trousers. Is that clear, yes, ma am. I bow to your superior taste in all matters of dress sense, good, that's all right then. Of course, at parties and during moments of silliness you may, on occasion wear pants on your head, but that's a different circumstance. Understood, boy, yes, ma am. Pants on the head. Understood, this time Mark started the kiss. Then Carrie broke off and held Mark at a distance, looking at him seriously. You said you weren't t sure what to do with your power. Well, I s n t it clear. You be yourself, and you make life better for people. I don't t mean by making everybody rich or anything, but just helping. You can do things no one else can. So make the world better, Mark nodded slowly. Yes, he said. I can see interesting possibilities, now kiss me again. Superman I can think of other possibilities. They kissed again as the lovely autumn evening deepened around them in the swing park. The man in the trees up the hillside found his electronic night vision binoculars had stopped working. 36 Another day. On another day, one of those high, fresh, blue and windy ones in October that bear the promise of the winter to come, when the dusk came early. Mark went alone to visit his father's grave. Using information his mother had given him, he had traced it to a corner of a large cemetery in Glasgow. It was a simple gravestone, laid flat but not quite flush in the earth. It bore the inscription, John Daniels and the dates of his life. On either side were the older graves of complete strangers. 
His father S. Stone has lost the sheen of newness. It had not been terribly well tended. Mark reflected. He took a small pebble from his pocket. He tossed it in his hand. It glistened in the slanting afternoon light, and Mark looked once again at its strange luster, and the patterns in the stone's swirling folds. On close examination it gave off a faint light of its own. This, said Mark, is for you, Dad. I think you would have appreciated it. He knelt and, getting his hand dirty, made a shallow hole at the head of the grave and pushed the pebble into it. It doesn't come from Earth, Dad. We picked it up from one of Jupiter's moons the other week. But how I got it is our secret, right, wind caught the first falling leaves and threw them in energetic spirals around the gravestones so that they seemed to compete with each other for the fun of taking part in some playful magician's fanciful game. The wind made Mark's long coat flap against his legs. It's by way of saying thanks. Mark whispered. He ran his fingers through his hair and smiled. You gave me this power I have. It was your action that caused this. But I am taking it slow, Dad. The word was unfamiliar on his tongue and sounded strange to his ears. I am taking my time and learning the ropes, trying out a few things. I don't know where this will end. But I think the time ahead is going to be interesting so thanks dad. You could have killed me, but you've a made me well. I am not quite sure yet what I am. Time will tell. I guess. I just wish I could have but Mark could not finish the expression of his wish. He had no more words here at his father's grave. A moment later the only living people in the cemetery were a couple of grave diggers way over by the perimeter wall, too busy in their task to recognize the boy from the cover of time and the face from all the news programs three months before, and too engrossed to have noticed something utterly extraordinary a boy vanish without a sound amidst a spiral of colored autumn leaves. 36 Logan No. 5. Night falls quickly in southern climes. Logan reflects, and begins to relax a little in the little room in the small villa he has the use of. The window is open, for the dark evening is warm still, and offers a view over the lit farmhouses and self-catering lodges that sprinkle the shallow valley. Cicadas grate in the trees. The night is so still. Logan dabs his nose with the now always present tissue in his hand. The blood flow has stopped again. He forces his shoulders to ease their tension. Never has he felt so alone. The league is all but disbanded, the supernet connections shrinking daily as Interpol catches up with the members. He did well to cross the channel and get into Italy without being picked up and he has been keeping a low profile since arriving here in this quiet village. But inactivity, and the pain in his head are driving him out of his mind and he dares not get medical assistance. Capture, he well knows, would mean a very long jail sentence indeed. You don't leave unexploded homemade nuclear bombs in your flat without incurring the wrath of the powers that be. Tonight he feels restless. He stalks over to the mirror on the dresser by the window. The face that gazes back at him looks haggard now, pale despite the Italian sun and faint traces of grey lace his slicked back dark hair. Rings under his eyes testify to the fatigue he feels almost constantly. He is beginning to look old. So tired. Something unusual attracts his attention, through the window he sees in the distance a series of headlights, close together, approaching the turn-off to the villa. The cars move with urgent speed. Logan gets up and moves closer to the window. The villa is equipped with guns. Should he prepare now? The curtain sways gently in the breeze from outside. The hairs on Logan's neck prickle and suddenly he feels a cramping feeling in his stomach. A few weeks ago he would have called this an adrenaline rush. Now it registers as fear. His head is pounding. There is someone behind him. He is sure of it. Someone extremely dangerous. He cannot turn. His head is thumping, his knees weak and he knows, just knows someone is behind him, but he cannot, not for worlds, turn around. The approaching cars have turned into the driveway leading to the villa. The order has been given for them to turn on their blue flashing lights. Logan knows he must get guns and defend himself he must go out fighting. But he is too afraid to move away from the window. Logan, the voice behind him is calm. Quiet. It is a young voice. Logan's legs sag and he leans against the dresser but still cannot face the owner of the voice. It is time. The hand settles on his shoulder and Logan flinches away. The grip tightens and it is absolutely inescapable. Window, flashing lights, dresser, villa, and dark Italian evening fade into blackness. Logan is terrified. 
He does not know what the hell is happening. There is a rushing sensation. Then light appears again a cheap dim 40-watt bulb, unshaded, seen through bars, steel bars, and the smell of damp and piss and rotten garlic and stale tobacco. Bars Logan knows he is in a prison. The hand leaves his shoulder and Logan now finds the strength to turn round. You. The Daniels boy stands facing him, his gaze level and completely unafraid. Power crackles all around him like faint blue lightning. Not at all like the last time they saw each other. Logan's terror intensifies. How? What have you done? How have you done this? What are you? Mark smiles, almost sadly, almost pityingly. Goodbye, and he vanishes, into the air. One second Logan sees him standing plainly in front of his face. Not two meters away, and the next second there is no Daniel's boy there at all. No bangs, no flashes, no weird sounds, just silence and absence. Logan grabs the bars of his prison cell and begins to scream. An Italian policeman comes running to see who can be making such a noise. 37. It was a cold Saturday afternoon in late October, when Carrie visited the Soros ship. The sky above central Scotland that day was a brilliant blue as a high-pressure system settled itself over northern Britain. Hoar frost sparkled on wide fields and a light dusting of thin snow whitened the higher mountain tops visible from touch. Mark called on Carrie. Jin showed him into the lobby. Carrie's parents stepped warily around the young man's celebrity. Their initial dislike had now evolved into a more amenable toleration. Jin even smiled weakly at Mark and had almost started a conversation before Carrie called from the upstairs landing that Mark was to come up to her room. Mark shuffled awkwardly past and his distrustful gaze. Hey, Carrie said as Mark joined on the landing. Her voice dropped to a whisper as she ushered him into her bedroom. What do you bet one of them comes upstairs in a minute singing a Rolling Stones song to advertise their presence and to stop us from doing anything we re not supposed to? Or they ll come armed with tea and biscuits, I don't know what you've got in mind. I don't know what I am not supposed to be doing, oh yeah. Daniels. I am going to pinch your ears, to starting to save the world count as something we re not supposed to be doing. The door was now closed and they could kiss, so they did. Okay, said Carrie, stopping for breath. How does saving the world actually start? Do I need to pack warm clothing? Mark laughed. No nothing like that. Okay, stand close beside me. Yes, holding hands is good. Now. I just imagine a kind of protective envelope or skin surrounding us both, to Carrie's eyes the room seemed to shimmer slightly around her. And then, hey presto, Carrie had the merest sensation of falling and then. Oh my god. She blinked and found herself on the deck of the Soros ship. The transfer took less time than it took to take a breath. In the huge viewscreen space stretched out before her. The ship was turning gradually and Earth drifted into the field of vision. Hey look. There's Scotland. It is still a nice day there. Not a cloud in the sky. This is better than Google Earth. Can it zoom in? It can zoom in. Zoom through and out the other side. Look, here's your house. Instantly the screen seemed to flash towards Earth and narrowed down to the little town of Touch, then a red slate roof, then some kind of X-ray imaging facet kicked in, the roof became transparent and Carrie's bedroom was clearly visible, just as they had left it moments before, look at this. Mark put slight pressure on the hand control in front of him and dark marks appeared on Carrie's bedroom carpet. I've enhanced the carpet indentations where we walked in your room. Those darker ones are our footprints you re-seeing. The ones that are less dark are your ones from earlier, that's pretty cool, and you can check on what your parents are doing. The focus shifted to the right and downwards and Jin came into view. He was at the foot of the stairs, looking up, clearly dying to know what Carrie and Mark were up to in her room a concerned protective parent. Sound kicked in. He was humming Jumpin' Jack Flash, how can it get sound? We must be a million miles away from Jin, I don't know how exactly the ship does most of the things it can do. Maybe it can interpret vibrations in the air I just don't know, Carrie reached out and touched the console with her fingers. I can almost feel the power of this thing. It is vast, Mark nodded. It certainly is. Look at this, instantly the screen showed a bird's eye view of an office building that, it became obvious, was the headquarters of the CIS. The focus became Robert's office his desk his computer. His computer files came up on the screen. 
but he s not even there, no he s at home right now with his family, but his machine s not even switched on, I know. Mark replied. It s magic. There is very little the systems on this ship can t let us access. So I know what the surveillance teams are up to everything, so how can we use this like I said, well. I was thinking about that. If we screen all the communications in, say Scotland, and listen for particular phrases, say drugs. Suggested Carrie, my thought exactly. And then we just. It became clear after a few minutes of mobile phone intercepts that a shipment of drugs was being ferried across the North Sea at that moment in an old fishing boat. The captain had just called his contacts ashore to confirm drop-off point. The Soros ship had pinpointed the precise location of the fishing boat. What shall we do about that? Asked Carrie, notify the police. Tell Roberts, well, if we do that, they ll start asking us all sorts of questions and that could get awkward, yes, you rewrite, but if you ll excuse me for a moment, Mark vanished. Hey. Get back here. Daniels, Carrie thumped the console. The screen suddenly showed a zooming in image of the fishing boat. As the boat loomed larger on the screen a dark figure appeared at its stern, out of sight of the two-man crew in the small cabin. Carrie could feel the rise and fall of the boat on the swelling waves. Mark appeared to sink into the wooden deck. He was in the hold. He found the cargo a big one, a fortune in heroin. He reached out with his right hand and touched the cases that held the drug. Energy flowed from his fingers and at the molecular level began to work a different kind of magic. Seconds later he reappeared at Carrie's side. What did you do? She demanded. I turned it into sugar, sugar, yeah there are going to be some pretty upset people later on today. Shall we push this a bit further, okay, but take me with you this time. Don T go flying off all by yourself, there is a container ship, a big one, heading for Hull. One of the containers has another shipment cocaine this time. Shall we, let us do it. They transferred aboard the ship, holding hands. Carrie could feel the vibration of the vessel's engines under her feet, and smell the salt in the air mixed with a rusty metallic oiliness. Large cargo containers painted in various colors loomed above and ahead of her. Do you know which container it is? Of course I do, of course you do. Shouldn't t we take cover hide, no need. The infrared scan is showing that there s no one around. Mark led the way down a narrow passageway between piled high containers, each 10 by 5 meters and 3 meters high. It s this one. He touched it and its rusting doors parted. Inside Carrie could clearly see pack after pack of white powder. If you change it into flour. She mused. They might still make some bread out of it, ta-da. My sidekick, folks, the Joker, Carrie nipped Mark's arm. He touched the container side and the energy flowed from his hand again, entering into the molecular structures of the drug, shifting electrons, changing essences. It s done. He said. As simple as that. Let s go. They entered a leafy suburban street, but the air was filled the nasty smell of a house fire. People were shouting and screaming. The lights of several fire engines and ambulances flashed. What the hell is this? Asked Carrie, we re in Manchester. I picked up a message from one of the firemen's radios. He s inside that burning building. It s a care home for the elderly. Someone is trapped in that room he pointed to a third floor window and he can t get through. You should wait here for this one, I l l wait here. Be careful. She watched as Mark walked quickly into the gathering crowd then faded from view. The home was a large one, converted from an old red brick Victorian mansion. Unsightly fire escape stairwells marred the outside of the building. Firemen were moving on these, escorting people slowly and carefully down to waiting paramedics before going back up. The fire seemed to be most intense towards the rear of the building. Emergency staff spoke urgently into the small mics beside their mouths, attached to helmet radios. More ambulances threaded their way through the people that had interrupted their Saturday afternoon to come and watch or help. Minutes passed. Carrie began to appreciate the implications of Mark's power. Now she understood with perfect clarity why he had to hide the truth about his capabilities. If people knew what he could do, he would be in constant demand to set things right. Stop this bank robbery, catch this burglar, rescue this cat. 
Or, if the military got hold of him, well, she had seen enough movies and TV documentaries to have formed the opinion that the military, despite the kindness and consideration shown to her from those she had met during the summer, were not always working from the best of motives. Britain still had forces posted in trouble spots around the world the Burmese conflict, the mess in the Middle East and the Afghanistan situation rumbled on. It was not impossible they could try to use Mark to ensure success in these areas. After all, from what she now knew, he could go places no one else could, he could access any data, anywhere, and with that protective shield he used when teleporting, he could be unstoppable.